review them again. There's also a copy before you as well. And if there is a motion to approve the minutes, one will so be entertained. So moved. All righty. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Awesome. Awesome. Next, we will have the homicide and shooting data update by Captain Cobalt. Thank you. I'll take the opportunity to sit this month. I think I, my feet hurt standing a long time <laughs> last month. So um, I did uh, make a presentation for this month's meeting. I know there were a lot of um, questions and follow-up items requested, so I thought this would be the easiest format uh, to do this. So again, I'm Captain Justin Cobalt with the Police Department and the Enforcement Chair of this program. I'll start with the new items and then work our way uh, to the follow-up items. Um, for the homicides, I thought the easiest way of doing this would also be to kind of show, um, and I'll, everybody can take one of these and pass them around. This is our daily uh, homicide analysis. This is updated on our website every day, um, and we can, we can switch to the next slide there, uh, and I think everybody may have the PowerPoint in front of them. They had some copies over there. Uh, the link is contained in the uh, PowerPoint here. We have a crime statistics link on the website. And one of the first things there is our daily homicide analysis, and you will get this sheet here in front of you. Uh, the, the main numbers are across the top there. Year to date, we've had 98 homicides compared to 125 at the same time last year. You can also see the three years prior to that are listed up there uh, at the same time. 90 in 2019, 85 in 2018, and 94 in 2017. And you can see the totals in parentheses uh, on that sheet. You can also see a snapshot of the case statuses, the predominating, uh, predominant contributing factors if they're known in cases, as well as uh, some characteristic information of victims and suspects. I know there were some specific questions on those last month. Um, also included in there are the means of attack, if, if the weapon is known for the homicide, as well as uh, a breakdown by patrol division geographically. Um, could, Justin, over, could you wait? I don't think the slide yeah, caught slide. up to your presentation. Sure. Uh, yep. Turn it up here. It's not moving at all. Give me a second. I do have it on a flash drive as well, if, if you want to well, no, try that. Uh, I have it pulled up. It's, it's, uh, it's not advancing for us for some reason. So you might have to close it and bring it back up. And it, it may make sense to maybe have them follow along on the sure. hard copies they have before them. Yeah. Does everybody have a copy of it? Yeah, I think they're out. Okay. Yeah. No. All good. Yeah. I just know we. You want me to go ahead and you can catch up if we get there? Yeah. Yes, okay. please. Um, and we're still on the first slide, um, but that's kind of the numbers uh, compared to the, the previous uh, four years as well. Over the last year, obviously last year uh, was our, our record-setting year, unfortunately. But over the last 12 months, we've seen a 21.6% decrease in homicides. 
Um, I was going to mention as well um, on the KCPD website, uh, along with this form that you see here, the daily homicide analysis, uh, there, there's quite a bit of information there for transparency's sake. Uh, there's a calls for service dashboard that you can go to that lists out all the calls from the previous month, uh, broken down by category. They're all mapped out. You can kind of see where uh, people are calling for help uh, in the city. Um, and they'll, they'll trend uh, with some maps that we'll see later in this presentation as well. Uh, there's also a, a map there called the City Protect map. It's cityprotect.com. It's a website, uh, but it's a great resource as well. You can go through um, and zoom in on any area of town, your neighborhood, where you work, um, but you can zoom into any place and you can filter it by dates and see what's going on in that neighborhood. Um, if we don't have as many follow-up items, maybe at a subsequent meeting, um, that's something we can kind of go over and show everybody in depth. But there's some great tools there uh, to get a picture of violent crime in Kansas City. Justin, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, that cityprotect.com? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yep. And so, yeah, you go to the KCPD website. There's a crime statistics area. Um, it's actually, I think, called Crime Mapping is the sublink. Uh, and it's a spot where you can go in there, you click accept their terms and conditions, and you just zoom in, filter it however you want. Uh, you can do anything with the data. That's awesome. Um, and it gives, it doesn't give specifics, but it gives the type of crime, the location, uh, the date and time that it occurred, and the case report number, so that somebody could go and seek a police report if they needed to um, and had access to that. Like a redacted one. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, moving on to the non-fatal shooting report, uh, previous slide there. Uh, this is uh, how we report or present our non-fatal shooting information on a weekly basis. Every Monday, this is updated um, and presented uh, and distributed within the department. This is really uh, a tally, a table that goes month to month, and it also includes the previous three years. But you can see uh, and get a picture for each month how many shootings are occurring. Again, these are gunshot wounds that are criminal in nature. So that's kind of the definition of a non-fatal shooting. So each of these are not a case. There can be multiple victims in a case. These are the actual count of people uh, that have a gunshot wound. At the bottom, you can see the totals from those previous years. 2018, there were 450, 491 in 2019, 2020 last year, 630. Uh, trending up, obviously, with our homicides. You see a pretty tight correlation there between homicides and non-fatal shootings. Uh, year to date, we're at 344 non-fatal shootings compared to 407 at the same time last year, so a 15% reduction over the last 12 months. That's all I have on the new data, and so I'll go to the follow-up items uh, that were requested from last month's meeting. Starting with, uh, and, and the, those are all listed, I'll go through those on the subsequent slides. Uh, homicide victims by race in 2020, uh, on the next slide please. Uh, you'll see here, this is just uh, the categorical breakdown um, by number as well as percentage based on race and gender. Again, this information is also included for the current year on the daily homicide analysis report that I gave you. Uh, 176 total victims last year, and again, you'll see kind of the breakdown. The next slide is year to date for 2021. Uh, this was actually of July 28th. I was on vacation for a couple weeks, so I'm back. But uh, the current one is on the daily homicide analysis where you'll see the updated numbers there, um, but kind of the same pretty close percentages um, that we kind of see. The next slide is non-fatal shooting victims by race from 2020. Again, similar percentages, obviously a higher number. Uh, there were 630 total non-fatal shooting victims, and you can see the breakdown uh, by race and gender uh, listed there. Following slide is the same information for the calendar or for 2021 year to date. Uh, and again, broken down by the, at that time, 300 total victims. And you can see uh, similar percentages there and the total numbers listed. Next slide uh, was requested information on our juvenile victims and suspects. I think the easiest way, the, the complication with this was that uh, there was a change in law of defining what a juvenile, uh, what age a juvenile is. So for 2020, 17-year-olds were considered adults, and for 2021, they're not. So that's kind of why there's three columns here. Um, the easiest way of, of kind of explaining this, 2021, that's current. The middle column is kind of the corrected information, so it includes 17-year-olds as juveniles so that we're kind of comparing 
apples to apples here. Um, those are not year to date. Those are the totals from 2020 and then where we were at two weeks ago in the right hand column for 2021. So casualties are the first row there. Uh, we've had seven casualty victims that were juveniles this year compared to 13 in total last year. A casualty for definition's sake is essentially a non-criminal gunshot wound. So generally an accidental shooting. It could be somebody pulling a gun out of their waistband and accidentally shoots themselves. It could be a child that got a hold of a gun. Uh, there can be other uh, criminal investigations there and charges that could happen, uh, particularly with a small child that gets a hold of a gun. Uh, but for sake of this, those are the types of things that would fall under a casualty. It was not a criminal assault uh, that resulted in that shooting. For non-fatal shooting victims, again, those are the criminal, uh, the assaultive uh, gunshot wounds. There's been 26 juvenile victims in 2021 compared to 65 uh, for the total of 2020. Homicide victims, we've had eight juvenile victims this year compared to eight for the entirety of last year. Non-fatal shooting suspects, there's been two identified juvenile suspects uh, in 2021 compared to 17 in the totality of last year that were identified juvenile suspects. Homicide suspects, we've had four this year of, that are juveniles and six for the totality of last year that were juveniles. And the last two rows there are victim total, suspect totals. Those are just adding um, the different categories of victims and suspects together uh, to show it in a different manner. Are there any questions on the juvenile part? Okay, uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, there was several questions about homicides and non-fatal shootings by zip code. I've got two slides for each category here of homicides and non-fatal shootings. The first one is a map. I know, uh, I'm guessing none of you can read the zip codes there on the left side of that map. So those will all be listed on the next slide. But I think the map is a good visual representation of where violent crime is occurring in Kansas City. We've done, uh, to, to sidetrack for just a second, we've done multiple studies over years and, and compiling of violent crime statistics and it's really been this area that you see on these maps, and, and you see it here on the previous slide, and you'll see it on the next slide. Uh, it's really kind of a triangular shape that's St. John on the north, 85th Street on the south, Troost on the west, and Topping on the east. And every year, uh, 75 to 80% of our violent crime occurs in that 34 square mile area. So you've got 10% of the land mass of the city, uh, and 75 to 80% of the crime uh, is occurring in that geographic area. And so that's what you see represented uh, as well on the homicides. On this, this second slide, those are the actual zip codes that were broken down. Uh, if you wanna go back one, no, you're fine. Um, those are the actual counts of homicides from 2020 and the zip codes that they occurred in. And then on the next slide is the same information uh, and this map will show the non-fatal shootings. So pretty much the same areas, uh, just more instances of non-fatal shootings. I believe we had 630 non-fatal shootings. So you start to see a pattern uh, in the maps. Um, I actually went back and, and was looking for some information on these previous studies and I found a, a chief's blog from uh, Chief Forte in 2016, um, kind of reporting to the city on some of this information. And it's, it's pretty much kind of the same maps that we see here and it was actually 80% of the violent crime, but 90% of the violent crime, the victim or suspect lived in that location, in that 34 square mile area. So it could have been that the shooting happened in, in Westport, but the victim or suspect lived in this 34 square mile area. So geographically, um, we know where the violent crime's occurring, right? And it's kind of the same maps that we've seen uh, for some time. So figuring out how to solve that is obviously what we're all endeavoring to do here. Uh, the next slide will show uh, the same information broken down by the actual zip code and uh, the tally of non-fatal shooting victims um, per zip code. So moving on, the next slide, there were some questions about recovered firearms and dispositions. For 2020, you see we've recovered, uh, for last year, recovered 2,549 total firearms. Two different categories of firearms, evidence, and you see handguns and long guns there, and safekeeping handguns and long guns. 
evidence are obviously going to be part of an active criminal investigation. Safekeeping firearms could be a variety of things. It could be somebody that just found a gun in their front yard, uh, somebody who had a relative die, and they had these guns in their closet, and they don't know what to do with them. They don't want them, so they bring them to the station and turn them in. There could be some mental health uh, issues where somebody is voluntarily turning in their firearms. There could be a variety of reasons, but there's kind of two categories there. We're, we're actively investigating something in regard to this firearm, or it's just been turned into us, uh, and it would be categorized as safekeeping. So you can see the breakdown uh, of each of those categories. Also, there were questions on releasing and destroying of firearms. During 2020, 633 firearms were released back to their owners, um, and 443 firearms were destroyed during 2020. Now, those are just, those acts occurred during that year. The guns could have been in our possession for years, right? They could have been tied to an investigation for years. They could have been in safekeeping, and somebody finally brought proof of ownership, and they were released. It doesn't mean that they come out of that 2,549 total firearms that were recovered. Specifically, when we're talking about destroying property, uh, it's something that's probably going to be held on to a little bit longer just to make sure we're not destroying somebody's property, right? We're not going to destroy a wallet that somebody, you know, gets turned in as lost property. Um, but those are the numbers. I just throw that caveat in there that releasing to owners and destroyed, those are going to carry back to 2019, 2018 as well. The next slide is the same information, but for this year, year to date, 1,000, and as of July 21st was when uh, the lab provided this information. 1,282 total recovered firearms, and you see the same categories there of evidence and safekeeping. 318 guns were returned to their owners year to date, and 440 guns have been destroyed uh, as of this date this year. Moving on to the next follow-up item were stolen firearms. For 2020, um, and I think hopefully it looks a little bit better on the printed copy here, I did my best. I'm not a spreadsheet wizard, so I was taking what people sent to me and, and putting it into a presentation here. But you see uh, on the right the, the crime type. That's a breakdown of the number of firearms stolen and the type of offense that they were stolen from. Obviously, the majority of these are going to be from stealings or burglaries, and you can see that reflected there. Theft from autos were the biggest uh, contributor by far. 540 firearms were stolen out of vehicles. Uh, but you also see some burglaries and some other sort of stealings there. On the left there, you can see the breakdown of, in total by patrol division, so kind of geographically where they're occurring. Uh, East and Center Patrol each had 25% of them, then on down. And the grand total of firearms stolen last year in Kansas City was 1,133. The next slide is, is the same information, but year to date um, as of uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and I apologize, this one's filtered a little bit differently since it was a year to date representation. But you can see again, same information on the right uh, of the types of crimes where guns are stolen and still the, the overwhelming majority of our stolen firearms are theft from autos. We've had 725 firearms stolen year to date and 337 of those were stolen out of vehicles. Uh, and you can see, again, the same representation there of the total count uh, geographically. Uh, one thing that I noticed here that was different from the previous year was Shoal Creek, it looks like, uh, you know, had a jump this year. I will say these are the actual number of firearms stolen, so it's not the number of reports. So you can have a gun store that gets burglarized and 50 firearms are stolen. Unfortunately, we see that. You could have a gun collector who had 40 guns stolen out of his basement in a burglary. So there can be some skewing there of the numbers for any particular patrol division, um, but we definitely see uh, some commonalities uh, with, with Center and East Patrol seeing a large fair, fair share of stolen firearms over both, both years. And so the last follow-up item I had was the next slide, was our gun destruction process. There were several questions on this about uh, the process, the budget for it, um, and so I tried to answer some of those questions here. Essentially, we have a local business that volunteers this service uh, to destroy firearms in Kansas City. So there's no cost to the police department or the city in that. Um, the guns are labeled to be destroyed by our crime lab and our property and evidence section. And once they have a, a bulk of firearms, they make this arrangement to go have the firearms destroyed. 
They're escorted from our property and evidence section by the lab personnel and tactical officers to the destruction site. This process is observed, verified, and documented by lab personnel and tactical officers. All firearms are shredded and verified to be destroyed by the lab personnel. And I will say, and I've dealt with them on, on several projects in the past, the lab and property and evidence have uh, the most stringent quality control measures you could ever imagine based off the accreditation that they hold as a crime lab. And so this kind of falls under that. So they do have an exact process and it has to be followed to the letter and they are audited um, frequently for processes throughout the crime lab to include uh, these types of things. So it is a very well refined process, um, but that's, that's the process there in a nutshell. Um, and so that was the last follow-up item I had, and hopefully that answered your questions. I don't know if anybody had any questions for me. All right. Perfect. Seeing no Thank questions. You. Thank you very much, Captain Take that Cobalt. To leave. <laughs> <laughs> that was extremely informative. Thank you so much for that presentation. And would you mind um, emailing me that so I can send it to Dr. Howard since he wasn't able to join us today? Sure. I know he was the source of a lot of the additional requests, and because you were so responsive, we want to get him that information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, also, during our last meeting where we learned of the Jackson County Prosecutor's Office public safety policy, um, there was a lot of discussion about how KCPD was going to respond um, to their new public safety policy. So, so, Chief, I will give you the floor um, so you can give us an update on whether where KCPD stance is with regard to that policy. Sure, thank, uh, you. thank you. Uh, we had a presentation. Uh by the prosecutor at our last board meeting. Um, we will have uh, two more presentations at the next board meeting by two other prosecutors, and I imagine there'll be some sort of discussion after that. Understood. So I don't know if it'll, there'll be a decision made on the 31st, but th that's when the two other presentations will be made. Understood, and th those will be taking place on the same day of the Board of Police Commissioners meeting at the same at, meeting. At the board meeting. Got it, perfect. Thank you for that update, Chief. Thank you. All righty. Now we will have our go own governing board member, Dr. Jones, uh, present to us on the health department's ver various uh, prevention programs that are housed under their department. So, Dr. Jones, I will give you the floor. Okay. All righty. So what I'll do um, is I'll just uh, provide a brief update of some of the things that uh, we have been doing. Um, I know that when we've talked in the past, there was some question around what exactly is the prevention pillar, what has it been doing, um, and what kinds of activities we have. And so I'll start talking through some of those. And so the overall framework for what we do is to say, hey, we know that enforcement is necessary. You know, we know that intervention is necessary. But how do we address some of the factors that we know are upstream to some of the, the things that we're seeing, sp specifically res with respect to violence? Um, and so I'll talk about a few different things. I'll talk about the part we are most familiar with, the Aim for Peace program, which has been a program with the Kansas City Health Department since about 2008. Um, I'll talk about some of the successes and challenges with that program. And then I'll go on to uh, some of the other activities that we've been, done to, been doing to get further up for, upstream. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the Aim for Peace hospital program, which most many of you may already be familiar with. Um, the aspect of that hospital program that has been ongoing um, is basically where uh, hospital responders uh, from the program go into the hospital um, once they receive a phone call from Truman or Research Hospital stating that there is someone there with any kind of traumatic injury, specifically a gunshot wound. So wherever they are in the city, even outside of the area that Captain Cobalt mentioned, um, Aim for Peace responds to those, and that is, you know, a lot of calls. Over the, just in the first six months, there were about 500 calls, um, and the program is not able to respond to all of them, obviously, but they responded to about two-thirds of them. These calls come in all times of the night, um, and they go out there and basically, you know, sit at the bedside of those individuals um, if they are able to speak and are, you know, not um, severely medicated. They're able to talk to them about the circumstances of their lifestyles that may have led to the shooting and talk to them about potentially changing um, their efforts. Now, unfortunately, a lot of times they are not in that position because they are um, under sedation or, or something else. And then sometimes we've had cases where people actually leave the hospital against medical advice because they are, you know, afraid of someone coming to find them or what have you or trying to evade law enforcement. Um, and so they are lost to our follow-up. 
But when it is successful, they are able to talk to them and give them resources to help them um, change their lifestyles that put them at highest risk for that um, incident. Um, the successes are uh, that they are they have been able to reach some of the people at highest risk. Obviously, they have you know suffered this injury and they're in that position. Um, the UMKC there is a UMKC study that was published in 2020 um, that stated that even though there's been an increase in the overall violent crime rate, aim for peace has been an integral an integral component to the trauma services, reducing recidivism for those people who receive their services, um, which was significant. Um, so that is that was something we we're counting as a success. The ongoing challenges of the program, because as great as our efforts might be to try to reach folks, we know that there are ongoing challenges. Some of them include the inability to stretch resources beyond a relatively small area. So right now we have about um, three individuals working in the hospital, or 2.5 to three people working in the hospital program, and two other people working on our neighborhood engagement piece. Um, and so that has been an, an issue. And then turnover and loss of staff. So, and I'll get to a little bit as to why that is in just a moment. Um, and then the fact that clients are highly transient and mobile. So you may talk to them today. Um, you may be going to visit them while they're in the hospital, but once they are healthy enough to leave, they may not want to deal with anyone. So there's a fear that the program is affiliated with law enforcement or um, I don't want, I want to disappear. I don't want anyone to know where I am or who I am. So I'll just leave. And so that has been one of the things. So if you're trying to collect data and see, okay, what do you need? Um, what can I do for you? Where are you now? Are you still thinking about, you know, being engaged in something violent or risky? How do we follow up? That's a challenge if they don't want to be found. And so um, that is something we're are, um, challenged with. And then the other piece about um, how do we fit people who, um, have in some sense been hired for the experiences that they bring to the table. So they have experience with people who have um, engaged in illicit activities um, and are now, they've now been reformed. They may have done time in the, the um, incarceration system, but now they're in this uh, program and they're working to do what we need them to do with high risk clients. But they're also having to learn a new culture of professionalism. And so, um, <laughs> that that has some interesting, uh, that has been an interesting challenge that has been ongoing. Um, we think we have a plan for how to address that and sort of more quickly bring people up to speed and be indoctrinated into a new culture, but we are inviting them from one type of thinking to another. So it, it, it that does have its challenges. Um, and so our targets for going forward, we know that we need to advance further upstream and target those at highest risk before they're actually injured. Um, and continue to obviously seek sustainable funding. Um, the next piece I'll talk about uh, is the KC Blueprint for Violence Prevention and Safe Healthy Communities. Um, so we are happy, and, and he'll introduce himself later, I'm sure, at some point to people, but I'm really happy about the success of hiring uh, Kevin Humphreys uh, to work as the Prevention and Policy Manager for our Office of Violence Prevention. You all may know I was previously in that role. And then I became a division manager, and so I was still trying to do that role at the same time. And um, he, I think he brings a wealth of, of knowledge and expertise, so he'll help us get some of these things back to moving. Um, and then we uh, have been able to re-engage community partners for some of the strategies that were outlined. So if you may recall, we had uh, suggestions in the blueprint about things like um, hiring interns, um, if you're a neighborhood, how do you watch a bus stop to make sure that it's safe, that the youth there um, are being properly supervised so that, you know, even at the grade school level, violence isn't an issue there, or conflicts are resolved peacefully. Uh, and so those are just a few of the examples, but we actually want to make sure that people commit to doing these things. So if you're a neighborhood leader and you say, well, there's nothing we can do for violence, we just have to wait for more money. Uh, we wanted to propose different things that can actually be done um, by any any sector. Uh, some of the successes are we were happy with our partnership with KC Common Good, and that we actually saw them roll out some of those. I know that has been a separate presentation, but we appreciated their partnership. Um, and then the neighborhoods we have who have contacted us and uh, committed to implementing at least two of the strategies uh, that were in the blueprint for their sector. Uh, local foundations who we've also spoken with who have agreed to look at their own funding practices and expanding um, what they are able to do um, and changing some of the ways they go about business. Um, and then we are also are appreciative of um, 
some of our partnerships with the Office of the Mayor and the City Council, and I think the efforts that we've seen, some of the different strategies and, and ordinances and resolutions that have been passed that we know um, fall under the same um, principles of the blueprint, so we're happy about that. Um, ongoing challenges to this initiative have been uh, COVID-19 efforts that have been taking higher priority. So internally as a health department, but also just even in the, the public discourse, um, people are very focused on what should we be doing about COVID-19 and what you know money has been flowing, um, but it's really specific to addressing COVID-19 infections, which is you know understandable at this time. But our goal and our challenge, uh, or our goal for this challenge is to uh, make sure that people remember we have kind of two big things going on right now, and we have to work on them both. Um, so targets for the next uh, steps in this area are to continue our um, appeals to companies, agencies, to uptake uh, the strategies that we listed in the blueprint. Um, we have been talking with um, a potential funder for a launch. So you do a big public launch where people actually commit um, and then in a year you go back, check back in with them to see where they are. That's something that we are planning. Um, how am I doing on time, Melissa? Oh, you're fine. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, and so the other piece is the safe opportunity, also out of the Office of Violence Prevention. And what this was, was $2,000 when we were, through our partner Community Capital Fund, we were providing micro businesses $2,000 um, for micro businesses. So if you're not familiar with micro businesses, these, these things go on all the time. So this is not like someone trying to start a restaurant. Um, this is someone trying to start a small scale lawn business, lawn care business, or someone trying to start a small scale catering business out of their home. Uh, we know that these types of businesses take place and we know that there is a space in the economy for these. There's, there have been studies on how these, this natural economy, micro economy exists, uh, but some people don't have access to it because they don't even have the, the limited funds required to launch them. So we've been able to partner with the community, community capital fund um, to fund these. And they also provide ongoing mentorship and training. So it's not just giving them a check, it's giving them um, funding and, and ongoing training to, to launch their business and run it effectively. So to date, um, over the past 12 months, we have uh, 34 businesses, so two cohorts have received these funds. Um, in the midst of transitioning to virtual training during COVID, all of that has been successful. Um, and we also are happy that the partners who were implementing the training uh, who have been engaged and paid through this opportunity uh, were also minority owned businesses you know people like Porterhouse KC and, and others who have been able to who have been able to be mentors and we also appreciate a partnership with the KC BizCare so those are successes the ongoing challenges for this um, project are just the pressing needs of agencies receiving funds so you're dealing with real people with real lifetime challenges, uh, we're thinking about like childcare. Um, they're thinking about like cars being repossessed while they're trying to launch their business. They're thinking about tickets and traffic tickets and things like that. So um, when we talk to our partner who has been implementing this for us, uh, they talk about, man, you, you get in and you want to talk about business plans and you wind up talking about all kind of other things, you know, how to, how to fix your, your credit and get stuff out of collections. So. Um, that has been a challenge, but a, a, you know, a challenge that we are um, excited to continue to address. So our targets for that program are to continue providing um, additional supports for those awardees. It's a time intensive process, it's a labor intensive process, um, but we believe it's worthwhile. Um, and then for targets, we want to provide a additional um, promotion and marketing of these businesses. So if we know that there are lawn care businesses being launched, um, somebody had like a party bus, I think, um, and there are other things being launched. How can we, um, we have all these kiosks around the city, how do we promote them so that they're getting some benefit? You, you only got $2,000 in cash, but you've gotten the mentorship, and you also got some promotion. Um, so that is something that we would like to turn the corner with um, pretty soon and get that going. Um, we also, um, the last thing I'll talk about is something that I'm uh, really happy about, our latest contracts. Um, not sure if people are familiar with strengthening families, um, but that is an evidence-based, I think it's like 20 years old, it's an evidence-based curriculum. You basically pull families together, uh, adults and their kids or their teenagers or school-aged children. Um, you feed them a meal and then you talk through this curriculum. It's a weekly curriculum, about a 10-week program. Um, and you talk about things like how to resolve household conflict, how to do positive disciplining, 
um, how to communicate. Um, and we, what we know is that it has been proven over 20 year time frame to reduce uh, youth delinquency, drug use, um, as well as conflicts. And so we know that a lot of the violence that we see comes out of household conflict. If you grew up with a lot of conflict, there's conflict in your household, there's domestic violence or what have you, you'll be more likely to use violence um, in your environment. And so we're really happy about that. We have seen families engaged in that. Our contractors have been doing a great job with that, engaging people, um, I mean, their neighbors, other groups. Where we'd like to turn a corner is to make it more accessible. So we've been thinking about do we do more of these neighborhood level small mini grants uh, for more people to do it. Right now we only have two contractors doing that, but what would it look like if we allotted smaller amounts to more groups of people to implement it on a smaller scale in their neighborhoods? So that's, uh, that sounded like a lot. I feel like I was talking a long time, um, but I'll entertain any questions. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It's good to hear what the health department is doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I appreciate, hopefully we get to, we find a partnership. Yes. So. <laughs> um, I've got a couple of questions. The first was um, on your hospital intervention mm -hmm. uh, program. Mm -hmm. Do you offer any wraparound services for for the um, those folks outside of counseling? Uh, there was some relocation services in the context of a grant. So some people needed yeah. a new emergency housing um, because of their situations. And so that was something that we were able to partner with an agency to provide, but that grant has termed. So not at this time. I'll just offer, that's maybe an area we could partner okay. a little bit and, and see what we could do for you. And then just, um, because I'm always curious for my own crew, you know, like any kind of tra trauma treatment that you offer to your staff, yes. you know, that do that kind of this kind of work. And could could I come? No, absolutely. <laughs> so actually, Aim for Peace just put on a trauma secondary trauma training um, in partnership with Truman Behavioral Health, and they'll do another one shortly. So we'll make sure that's uh, distributed. But that was pretty well attended. Just teaching, talking to all the people who do this type type of work how to take care of themselves and how to prevent secondary trauma. So, no, definitely we should share that more broadly. Thank you, Libby. Mm -hmm. Any more questions for Dr. Jones? I have a few. Mm -hmm. um, one's going to be for this program, and it's something we ask the police department all the time, and it's fair we ask mm -hmm. every other department. How do we measure success mm -hmm. with these programs? Yeah, yeah. So that is, that is something that uh, we've been talking about a whole lot. And that it continues to be a challenge. So what the way we have traditionally measured this has been how many people you reached, how many people came through, how many calls you received, how many times you went to someone's bedside, how many people you, you provided a service, right? Um, that's how we have typically measured. But what we realize now is that it is hard to show the impact when you're measuring that way. Um, what we are turning the corner toward measuring more of is what comes out of that, what comes out of those, what we call touches, um, and that is, has been the challenging part because we're basically trying uh, the, the field in its entirety measures in that same way. The hospital intervention program is measured by how many people you see and then recidivism. So that study that the UMKC and Truman did about recidivism, but you got to have something more than those two measures. And so that's what we're trying to identify. And then this is primarily grant supported or is this pure kind of health levy and city budget? Where's where most of your resources coming from? For the hospital part or all of this stuff? All of it. Okay, all of that has been, um, for the hospital worker that is on a grant um, that is ending uh, next month, um, but we've been able to pull together some other funding to sustain that piece. Um, and then the other programs I talked about as far as the safe opportunity and the other, um, the small grantees doing the, the um, program, this uh, Strengthening Families, those are all health levy dollars. Because, you know, and uh, the prosecutor just left, but I'm, I'm intrigued um, mm -hmm. where we might be able to up front um, either combine, pool resources, all those sorts of things. Because as is the nature of the health department, you all work with everybody. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that the city's tried to put more money into the Casey Bizcare office, who you're working with, which would be a wonderful support. Uh, you know, I would think that certain funds, either from the county, combat, something of that sort, can kind of collaborate with all of these so that we, that we're able to, I think, keep consistency in them. For your, for this budget year, I guess you've 
found grants to support the, the folks in the hospitals. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you have the resources? Do you think keep performing the program at the level you would like, or are you behind on that? And yeah. in future budget requests, will you right. increase it, all that sort of stuff? Right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So we are, um, we've been talking to our uh, fiscal folks at the hospital or um, our fiscal person to help us prepare for the next funded request because what we know is that by itself, the hospital piece um, for this program is not sufficient. We've had to cut the outreach aspect of um, the Aim for Peace program. So the problem is you can try to stretch and stretch the people who are in the hospital to also do some of the street work, but that becomes unsustainable. It has already become unsustainable. So we are preparing to, to make a, a bolder request um, for this next cycle. Um, yeah. And so we are also thinking about how do we better partner with the community when we're doing that. So we realize that the model of the program maybe has not been sustainable. And so how do we bring more groups into it um, in alignment with some other cities who have done this type of program, the cure violence model such as Baltimore, where they sort of contract, contract out smaller groups. They, have to, they still have to do the model, um, but they are more dispersed and it's not so centralized in the department. Okay. That's interesting. I'd be interested in meeting the gentleman who works yes. with you now, by the way. I, I don't know if we've chatted. Nope. You mind introducing yourself yes. to us? Come on up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm legitimately black. Like tell you were going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. Um, Are they here or here words? Go to the okay. microphone so I know who you are, too. <laughs> All right. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Kevin Humphreys, and I'm from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, but I'm pleased to be here in Kansas City. And uh, as Dr. Jones was letting you all know, I will now be working with um, Violence Free KC uh, and working in general just with the, the violence pre uh, initi initiatives mm -hmm. under the health department. So, And would you be the director of, of the Violence Free KC initiative now? Uh, we, are the, we are technically staff support because that's an entity of the health commission. Okay. So we would be continue to be the health commission, health uh, violence for KC support, but he would, uh, would be the director of the Office of Violence Prevention. So okay. the group within the health department. And then do you have any new plans in the Office of Violence Prevention, or will it be kind of what we've been working on previously? What's uh, mm -hmm. And remember, all my questions are generated from, imagine I'm in a neighborhood meeting tonight and somebody's saying, what are you all doing? Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. I want to know who you are. Got you. So I can describe yeah. that and describe what you're doing. Great, great. Yes, well, um, uh, Dr. Jones, uh, before I came on board, I worked on uh, a blueprint and a blueprint to, to prevent uh, violence. And so we're looking now to pick, pick, pick that back up, really implement that. Well, actually, you know, it's, it's already been ongoing, but I'm uh, looking to pick up where Dr. L Jones left off and implement that. And, and that has many different initiatives there. Uh, many initiatives that have been proposed and we're seeking to kind of narrow down which initiatives we would really like to focus on with the blueprint and, and really uh, try to hit the ground running with it. And do you see that work then coming more in the form of introduction of, of more ordinances? We certainly have heavy policy work that we've seen. Mm -hmm. Is it more outreach? Are you grant raising uh, uh, kind of where's or maybe it's all of the above? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and, and Dr. Jones, you can definitely chime in on <laughs> these uh, but but basically you know from what I've seen is it, it seems like a lot of partnerships that we're really seeking to utilize um, and you know for example things like having businesses work with schools to prepare students after they've graduated to be ready for for the marketplace so uh, I think we're really looking at, at what what partnerships can, do we have in the city and, and around the table and, and looking to, to utilize those. Mm -hmm. That's all I got for now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Any more questions from either representative from the health department? All righty. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will have Captain Bowman come present on the risk terrain model, modeling strategy utilized by the police department. Yep, either or works. Whatever you're most comfortable with. Can we use this mouse to advance the slides by chance? Uh, no, we don't have a clicker. Oh. Uh, just, just say next slide and I'll... Okay. All right, we'll work through it. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Captain Bach from KCPD. Uh, I've been on for about 18 years now. Uh, appreciate the invitation to come speak to you all today. For a handful of folks in the room, this material I'm going to go over will be a little bit familiar, but for those that aren't as familiar with it, I hope uh, you find it enlightening with what we're trying to do here on KCPD and with many partners, including those at municipal departments, to, to make our city safer. Um, so today I'm just going to quickly define what the strategy is all about. It uses a strategy called risk-based policing. Um, I'll also go over our results that we had in our first year deploying this, uh, what we did to achieve those results, and then the next steps that we're currently planning uh, to keep the, ev to the evolution of the strategy due to COVID-19, kind of putting things on hold a little bit last year. But uh, if you want to go ahead and advance, please. So to quickly define, uh, RTM stands for Risk Terrain Modeling. It's the, it start, this whole idea of risk-based policing was born out of risk terrain modeling. I know it's a lot of acronyms to throw around, but uh, in brief, about 10, 11 years ago, some uh, academics at Rutgers University developed this risk terrain modeling concept uh, to look at and analyze crime. But instead of looking at the actual crime incidents, the idea was what are the, the features of a landscape that are generating or attracting crime? Uh, and so for us that work in police work, a lot of things are rather common sense. It could be vacant buildings. Uh, perhaps uh, liquor stores, convenience stores, pawn shops, things of that sort. Um, and over the years, this singular analysis technique grew into a broader public safety philosophy, if you want to call it such, and that's what risk-based policing is. So that's what those two terms mean, and I'll go into a bit more detail if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so here uh, I had to have a visual aid of a thunderstorm because what we're not talking about is trying to have some crystal ball that will tell us exactly when, exactly where, and exactly who is going to commit a crime. That's not what this is about, and frankly, I think we would never want to go to that route. So instead, think of a, a thunderstorm kind of here. So just as a meteorologist kind of says, all right, the conditions are ripe for a thunderstorm to happen today, uh, that's kind of what we're talking about here. In this particular area, we've got these risk factors, as they're called, which, again, that RTM model tries to diagnose. And if we have these things all in the same place, crime is more likely to occur. So think of it as much more of a very educated guess about where risk is emerging not just crimes themselves. And if we can get ahead of the risk and mitigate that, the idea is then we can prevent crimes from happening in the first place, which is what we're trying to do here. Okay, next slide, please. So this one's multi-part, so if you want to tap it a few times in a row. So the way it works is, as you can see, different layers of data are coming in. And those three there, you can hit it one more time, please. There you go. So we have those individual risk factors that we map, and then we have a system that basically smashes those all together. So for those three individual layers, let's say they were, again, vacant properties, uh, convenience stores, and maybe bus stops. So we take the locations <coughs> of all those, smash them all together, and granted, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but where all those three factors are in the same place, if we feel strongly that's correlated with crime, uh, that's where we want to devote our resources. And by we, despite the name of risk-based policing, it's far more than just the police department. Uh, public works, uh, regulated industries, faith-based groups, anyone that has an interest in public safety, we can work with them and push responsibility where it goes. Because police, I mean, our actual training is based on law enforcement. That's what we do. But public works can do things we can't do. Uh, neighborhood preservation can do things we can't do. But it's where the eyes and ears for all these various departments. With, when we go about our jobs 24-7, we can then share that information and say, in this place, we've got you know, busted street lights, and we've had some robberies there that are also near vacant properties, and maybe there is something enforcement-wise we can do along the way, but we're trying to make it a multi-pronged approach to reduce and prevent crime. So then what we see here is this final risk terrain map that the police department can use, we can share it with our partners, so we all know where to go and be in the right places at the right times with the right resources. All right, uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just another visual. Um, I'm a crime analysis guy that's kind of been the niche I've carved myself, but another easy way to think of what we're talking about is to think of a park. Uh, if you want to tap it a couple more times, please. Uh, so if you start taking good features away, as you'll see some of these things are starting to blur out. If we start taking away the positive features of a park, few and fewer families are going to want to take their children to play there. It's just not as attractive anymore. So think of crime fighting in the same context. If we're taking out risky features that are generating crime, hopefully we're going to reduce victimization, Offenders won't see it as, a, as ripe an environment to commit crime, and so that's what we're going with here. So just another visual there that might make more sense to folks in the, the GIS mapping stuff for me. All right, next slide, please. All right, so for our results, uh, we're very happy with our results. Um, in just a couple moments, I'll have them come up, but just so you know the time frame we're looking at. Uh, we started our uh, evaluation term here. It was in, uh, started April of 2019, went through March of 2020. And we're excited to keep things going. We already had some very good positive outcomes in that first year, but 
with COVID-19 changing the environment in which we operate, uh, Executive Command, including Chief Smith, we made the right call just, you know, let's pump the brakes. We want to learn what we're working with here in COVID, and then we're just now starting to rebuild the strategy, rework it, and return to it. But uh, next slide, please. And it'll take a couple more taps. So for the crime reductions that we saw in the areas where we deployed this strategy, we applied that RTM concept citywide, but we wanted to make sure that commanders chose the most the areas where there are overlap between reported crime in the past where we saw the most risk. And so we saw a 22% reduction in homicides, aggravated assaults, specifically shootings and armed robberies in those areas, which was great. And they were statistically significant findings, so we can know that we didn't rely on just random <coughs> chance of that to occur. Um, our partners at Rutgers, we've worked with them for over 10 years. Uh, they did all the stats and evaluation for this, and we even published a paper with them with our results here. Uh, so they verified everything that we did here. And we're also very pleased to see, as you can read on the bottom half of that slide, that since it was much more crime prevention instead of just let's try and enforce our way out of these crime problems, in those same areas where we deployed the strategy, uh, officers self-initiated activity that resulted in enforcements, tickets, summonses, arrest, uh, went down almost 60%. And that's exactly what we wanted to see, that we could reduce crime while not having to rely on enforcement measures. We're not over-policing anything like that. It was pure crime prevention, talking with people, talking with business owners, and really trying to change things for the better from the inside out. Uh, next slide, please. I'll go and tap it one more time. So that was good just for outcomes. We're able to get a lot of confidence that this approach is telling us where to be in the right places with the right people uh, at our sites. Uh, when we took that risk model, think of that one final map I showed with those, I know they're kind of tough to see, but the light blue squares and the dark blue squares, those are the areas at the top 1% highest risk locations th look throughout the city. And when we applied that model to the uh, homicides and non-fatal shootings from 2019, half of our murders and almost 60% of our shootings were within basically three of those squares, and which is roughly the equivalent of two to three city blocks. So if you think of the top 1% riskiest places we identified, we are able to know that half of uh, the violent crimes we wanted to address were in those same areas, so we felt confident we were doing the right things in the right areas to achieve the results we wanted. Um, next slide, please. So for how we went about this, i got to go and hit the next slide, please. Uh, here, this is generally, I'll step aside for a sec just to give you some context. This is around the area of Armour and Truce, so we have 32nd Street up here, Truce down the middle, and Armour down here. So that's just a... Admittedly, this is a fictional data set, but let's say we've had some, you know, a couple robberies and some shootings here. Um, in the past, police, and we still have to do this, mind you, but we would say, all right, we've had five, six crimes occur here. What are we going to do? Let's read reports. What are our suspect descriptions? Are there vehicles we can look for? That's great, and we need to do that, obviously, but that's still reactive. So if you uh, advance the slide once, please. But in addition to that, with this strategy, there we go. Now, this is a real RTM model here. So looking at the back cloth beneath where these crimes are occurring, we can see factors such as, you know, the liquor store and a bus stop nearby, vacant properties, like a discount variety store. And then we can talk with our officers, talk with business owners, see how are these features interacting to maybe generate crime. And I was actually working in the field when we had this very area have some issues, and there was a bus stop in front of the uh, Metro PCS and a one-stop liquor store. Uh, folks would use the bus stop to loiter. They never really rode the bus, but then there was some dr low-level drug dealing going on in the cell phone store, quality of life issues nearby at the liquor store, and that's just kind of what had this recipe for crime, including some robberies and shootings. We contacted ATA, uh, confirmed there were no, there, if there was a way if we could move, relocate, or just take out that one problematic bus stop, which they did, but it did not disrupt uh, uh, availability for transportation for folks that needed the bus stop for legal purposes, but that cut down on the loitering, which affected the drug trade. We w came in from the enforcement piece to address what we should, but uh, the fire marshal helped with uh, the codes violations, things like that, and crime dropped double digits in that area rather quickly. Um, but the idea being, yes, we had to enforce where we needed to, but it wasn't just coming in with a heavy hand, stopping everyone we could in this area of armor and truce. We just didn't look at that, those risk factors in that model. That's what's driving it, and that's what we want to address instead. Uh, next slide, please. So next steps. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, due to COVID-19, we had to slow things down a little bit, um, but we're retooling the strategies as we speak. We have uh, some new models that have been run. Uh, commanders have chosen some new areas as well. Uh, so we're just basically booting it back up, uh, hoping to go bigger and better this time. Uh, we're looking to revisit some meetings with the uh, municipal departments that are going well. We're still in the planning stages of those uh, with the help of the city manager. Um, I'm actually eager to see if health department might have some input as well. Um, 
because one of the great things about this is even though we're looking to minimize risk factors, the idea is there's, if there's going to be a vacuum there, let's fill it with something good. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly where some of the programming you talked about could supplement the efforts that we're doing as well, and it could be a, a good partnership there. Um, so we're looking to expand on that. Um, other positive things we can bring in, you know, the KCPD, we have social workers, uh, whether it's PAL, other programming that we can bring in. I think it was uh, Prosecutor Jean Peters Baker, she mentioned other wraparound services that, you know, this is a very place based and prevention oriented program that we're looking at here. We're going to have, you know, we're going to encounter people that need help. And so if we're working these areas and we see, you know, the Boffman family, if they need, you know, some wraparound services, cool, let's introduce them to some folks that can help them with that as well. So we're really trying to, again, make these areas better from the inside out. Um, okay, and one other thing too that I know we did a good job of up front, uh, we met with community groups up front, explained to them how this policing strategy works, uh, how the model itself is created, and overall was received very, very well. Uh, but one thing I think we can do a better job of is getting more of a dialogue uh, with community groups. I think if I had some of this information when I was an officer going to community group meetings, we could have done a lot bigger and better things. Now granted, we didn't even have this almost 20 years ago. but. Uh, if we can go to community groups now and say we think factors A, B, and C are driving crime in your neighborhood, what do you think about that? You know, you may say, sure, A and B makes sense, but what about D and E? We can take that information, put it in the system, run a new model, and come back very quickly and say, yeah, you're right, we didn't think of that, but now we can look for those things as well. And I think that really opens up doors to have opportunity to build some trust and true relationships with the community. So we're working together to fix a lot of these problems that plague some neighborhoods because you know, they live, folks live there day in, day out. We may work there frequently, but, you know, we have to rely on their knowledge and experience. They know that better than we do. And I think this data-driven model here gives us an opportunity to do just that. So those are kind of nutshell next step plans. Uh, if you'll advance one more time, please. So to quickly recap, uh, you can go and hit it about five times. It should fill up a few bullet points. And then I'll address them real quick. Should be two more, one more. Okay, I'm almost finished. So uh, again, here we're talking about addressing you know, places and environmental features. Uh, we're not talking about people or person-based data, nothing like that. Uh, in that model, again, that I mentioned, this RTM model, it's purely environmental data. There's no arrest data, no parolee information, not even calls for service. So it's purely environmentally, spatially driven. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we kept it that way just to prevent any unintentional biases in the data or anything like that because we're not looking to increase stops here. We're looking to prevent crime. As far as transparency goes, building on that first theme, uh, and I think I know I mentioned this when uh, we met in, in the board meeting presentation as well, that virtually all the meeting, and a big shout out to the city's open data portal, we grabbed a lot of great information from their data portal, and that's what we use to create these models. So there's nothing secret here that you know couldn't be shared. I mean, a citizen could actually get all the same data. Uh, so it's very, very transparent and easy for us to talk about, which leads to that point in the middle about data-informed engagement, and that ties back to getting in, you know, more, uh, dialogue with the community about this, you know, again, it's not enforcement only, it's, hey, this is what we see, what do you all think in your neighborhoods, does this resonate with you, and what can we take back, you know, to make our models better. Uh, it's evidence-based, I know that's quickly becoming kind of a, a buzzword nowadays in policing and other disciplines, but again, this technique goes back 10 years, this is the, well, I guess we want to count the 2021 reboot, the fourth time we've actually done this since 2010, each time with success, and it's gotten slightly bigger and better each time but cities across the states and even the world have used this technique with success as well, so it's proven. And it's actually quite sustainable. Um, you can go as big or as little as you need to go with the resources you have. Uh, I guess resources are always a good thing, but uh, we, we've been able to, again, just incrementally increase it each time we do it, and uh, it's really a case of working smarter, uh, not necessarily harder, with the resources you have and being responsible with them. Uh, next slide, please. So final slide here. Uh, Again, without oversimplifying things, uh, this idea of risk-based policing is really as simple as one, two, three. Uh, you just start by making those risk train maps, get your data together. Uh, step two, just direct all our resources. And again, that's more than just police, but it could be NGOs, municipal departments, whomever. Uh, and then we can actually measure and evaluate our success as we go along. And that's where, again, that partnership we have with Rutgers comes in to be a very big asset for us. So we know that we could calculate some things internally, but it's great to have that third-party validation of, of knowing what we're doing is or is not working. And then you just repeat that cycle, and you can tap it three more times, please. So it really just comes down to diagnosing problems, deploying whether you see those problems are, and just hoping to prevent crime along the way. So far, we've been able to achieve just that. And that should conclude everything, I believe. Yep. Does anybody have any questions for the captain? Sure, please. Uh, do 
So do you see a drop in crime? Um, do you have any data that says that that lasts for a year, five years? Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I, I could have clarified that. Yeah, all those results went from 2019, or I'm sorry, 2020, 2020 to 2021. So a full year after we, we deployed, yes. So yeah, we were able to sustain it for one year. And um, we have to, since we took that pause, we're in the data gathering stage right now to see how when we retool and fully get redeployed, yeah, if we were able to even continue during that lag and see what may have happened more long term, but we're going to continue to evaluate, yes, to see okay. how things continually progress. And one follow-up, do you, so sometimes when crime drops in one area, it just moves to another area? Is yes. there any um, around that? Yeah, when our partners uh, evaluate everything, we did see what's called a diffusion of benefits, so it didn't just push it out of our immediate area, in other words. So the diffusion of benefits meant that there was a ripple effect of the good as well. So we had the, think of the sheet of paper as our study area, but around the paper, crime dropped as well for the most part. Um, and there was not any noticeable true displacement that we observed uh, directly. Um, but one thing that we do want to do is, like you're suggesting, you know, stay ahead of that. And um, the cool thing with this approach is we don't need new crime to think of where to deploy next is we refresh some of the data such as say three certain 311 calls from citizens whether it's uh, vacant properties and now I keep bringing that up maybe it's uh, broken street lights we can run that new model every one two three months and that's all right we're seeing it shift over this way we better see you know let's deploy over there see what we can fix before crime even takes root in that area so it can be a very very proactive way instead of just purely reactive and responsive Thank you. any more questions sounds very much like the search kids okay. yeah. and I know there's an initiative uh, that's actually part of the old NOVA called the CRT and mm -hmm. it's a group of neighborhood leaders and the Prospect Corridor mm -hmm. they're very much interested in this search kids model mm -hmm. I don't know what the correlations are with this with the RTM yes but we'd be interested in being a part of that sure effort to yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's a very common question we get. Is this just septed painted with a different brush kind of thing? And the best way I can answer it is it's how does the saying go like uh, all what is it, all lions are cats, but not all cats are lions kind of thing. So uh, septed certainly can be a part of this. Um, and yeah, you're right. I mean, if we see things such as uh, I don't know what it'd be off the top of my head, uh, poor cameras or maybe like convenience stores often have big placards and, you know, uh, advertisements that block the view of you know, people coming in that might be up to no good, things like that. Yeah, we can certainly try and make those modifications as well, but it's meant to be more than just like how you design the layout of, of a walkway or a building coming in. I mean, it can be a part of it for sure, but it can, when it comes to the risk factors, it could be more than just buildings. I mean, virtually anything that you can put on a map could be a risk factor, which may or may not in turn lend itself to being um, able to be addressed by like true septed principles. But simple answer, it's part of it. You could say that, yes. All righty, seeing no more questions, and that well, was I, my, I, oh, have a, I have a quick one. I'm, I've asked him to present um, two additional times. I've thanked you for coming to City Council and to this group, uh, and I'm glad the Chief and others ensure that you are at uh, the Board of Police Commissioners. I'm also glad that um, we've invested in this program. Um, a question that I have thought of anew um, in some ways relates to my colleague's question, which is not just how often you measure the results, but how often do you update the models? So. We recognize things change in communities. There's a new homeless encampment down the street. There's there's something else that's kind of changed activity. Is this something where every month you're looking to pull new data and thus have new relationships with the city, for example, um, and call public works about an encampment or anything else? Or is this something that we take a, a good deal more time to look at what the model really is? Yes, um, that's one thing, and looking back, I could have mentioned about our next steps. Uh, since we knew we wanted to be very empirical with how we evaluated that first year. We kept everything fairly static, so that the, the model remained the same. Our focus areas, as we call them, remained the same. But uh, moving forward, we're looking to deploy and make new models much more frequently. I think it's still yet to be decided, but I believe we're looking maybe a two or every three month because we want just enough time to get a good, valid set of new re refreshed data, such as the 311 calls and things of that sort. But um, we wouldn't want to go too small and make a new model, say, every week, even though that could technically be done, it probably wouldn't yield much benefit to continually redeploy that much. Uh, but to get to your question, yeah, we want to be a bit more dynamic and refresh data that way we're continually moving where we see that risk in that risk model emerge. That way we can hopefully stay ahead of the curve. And we can still along the way in talking with our partners at Rutgers, 
find ways to still measure that accurately and, and account for the shift of where risk is going and where we're deploying resources, whether it's police resources, city or otherwise. To what extent should a city um, use what you have, I guess, yielded in some of your data to, I guess, either plan for the future, build for the future, et cetera? Yeah. So um, you get the question. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. Uh, that's a good question. And I guess I can offer my opinion about that as sure. opposed to anything that's already been put in hard practice by other cities that I'm aware of. But, yeah, absolutely, I think there are planning implications. I mean, if we can use data to show that if you have, you know, a certain – what is the word I'm looking for here, a clustering of whether it's pawn shops or other types of businesses that we can show contribute to crime. If we're layering those very closely on top of one another, we're, chances are we're creating the very problems we want to avoid in the process. So I would venture to say that even though I'm not aware of any cities using it for pure planning purposes, I know other cities have taken this risk-based policing concept and it's given a different name since it's not policing, but uh, Dallas, for example, has done it. Um, who else tried it? Uh, I think Atlantic City did it as well. But it was more of a city-led initiative. Austin, I think, was also one. Um, but, yeah, but I think they're trying to see from more of a municipal government standpoint how can we use the same type of data to impact things, such as where we allow people to, to have certain types of businesses and things of that sort. Can I jump in? Yeah, I, sure. I think one of our, our last RTM areas was uh, in the Northland that's centered around some commercial businesses. And what we, I think, came from that is we wanted surveillance cameras mm -hmm. at a lot of these commercial businesses. Yep. And they're not too keen on putting them in. So yes. I think in planning, there could be some direction that if there's going to be this sort of commercial business or acts that, you know, there has to be some sort of surveillance or security prevention, mm -hmm. you know, processes put in place before there's a builder and occupancy license. And so I do believe some cities have, have done that. I, what's, I the, what's the best way, assuming we wanted to implement that, and the chief and I have talked about that with a few different business <coughs> types, but um, assuming that maybe every now and then we miss something, is would the most effective way be that someone regularly visits with you? Um, would it be a, a meeting with you in planning? I'd, uh, I recognize that you all have your mission, and I don't want it to expand too broadly, but I also see it bear, being very helpful when we look at Motel developments, apartments, <coughs> all types of uh, marijuana dis uh, yeah, dispensaries. dispensaries, things of that sort. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess simple answer in the context of this meeting, yeah, I mean, uh, one of my counterparts, Sergeant Miller, he was with me at uh, the city council presentation last week. Yeah, for now, we can serve as the point of contacts, and I can mention those new meetings that we're working through with the manager. I believe we asked for city planning to be involved yeah. at some point as well. I think that would be a helpful first step, but at least as far as the immediate dialogue of getting – data so people can make informed decisions, we can sure, surely help with that. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Boring I'll make with sure the chief's approval, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure city planning is there as well. Great. Um, Excellent. Because we've, we've discussed, I think, in the past kind of ordinances and, and things we might be able to do to, uh, to do uh, some of this that you're describing. Right. And in the same way it is like the, the park example, which I really appreciate, and that giant penguin and yep. everything else, that's it's a positive place to be. Absolutely. Making sure we don't do the converse with uh, some of our neighborhoods. So Precisely. thank you. That's great. All right. Seeing no other questions, that was my third time hearing that presentation. I learned something new every time, and it gets cooler and cooler every time. So thank you, Captain Boffman. Oh, that's okay. Yes, thank okay, you Okay, Boffman, absolutely. Now we will have A.J. Herman of the Mayor's Office to give us some updates on the happenings of the Implementation Committee. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good to see everyone today. Uh, so hopefully be relatively quick. And I know we've been here for a while and heard a lot of informative presentations. Um, the first item is the Implementation Committee has come up with a recommendation for a new name for this body. Um, that name is the KC Community Safety Partnership. Um, we have done some due diligence, and at least from current research, current knowledge, we are not aware of any other community groups using that. Um, for any ongoing initiatives in Kansas City. Um, there are a couple of other groups in other cities, but we think since it's a um, relatively benign name and not copyrighted or anything like that, we should be safe um, to move ahead with it. Um, so we would put that forward for your consideration um, and I guess approval today, if, unless there are any objections to it. What's the name again? The KC Community Safety Partnership. And we think that does encompass a lot of what this group is trying to do and come together around community safety, obviously, and the partnership aspect um, that this board uh, is seeking to address. And it seems to relate to the federal 
antecedent to this in some ways, the public safety partnership? That is true, and we thought that there was some sort of nice continuity there, um, but generally it's just more about, I think, the fact of the community coming together to try to be a, a safer place is really the, the heart of what everyone here is trying to do. Well, I'm no um, expert in it, but if it, if it helps us get federal grants and all types of other things, it makes us safer, then why not? Exactly. So I would, I would move uh, that we adopt the name of uh, Community Safety Partnership. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Great. We have Thank a name. You. We will update that. Uh, thank you all for your endorsement of that. Um, the other two items are relatively brief. Um, funding update, I think as the prosecutor mentioned in our last meeting, um, she has identified uh, some funds, um, extra funds uh, from COMBAT. Um, that will, could potentially help support the client advocates, which is Darren Faulkner and his team. Um, there's also some ongoing JAG grant funding that was previously devoted to them. So we think between those two funding sources, we should have enough funding to cover the client advocates for at least another year about. We're trying to figure out the um, exact amount with that, but at least for many months. Um, we also, as, as you all know, um, submitted an application to DOJ for their burn grant program, which would provide um, quite a substantial um, increase in the total amount of funding available to the program. Um, and we're hoping that we should hear back from that by your next meeting, which I believe is on September 21st. Um, the deadline for that grant is, and um, we will hear back before the end of the federal fiscal year, which ends on September 30th. So we're hopeful that we will have I guess a more detailed update on the funding situation and a, a more complete picture of where the gaps are and where additional funding may be needed um, at your next board meeting. Um, I also will note that we're looking at some potential administrative changes because that money will have to be routed through the city. Um, the city will actually have to accept the funds, so our office has been working on the ordinances that would um, endeavor to accomplish that. Um, Melissa, uh, Captain Cobalt, and Mike from the prosecutor's office will also be giving a presentation to city council um, on now the community safety partnership. So we're excited we get to use the new name um, on this Thursday at business session, um, which I think is exciting because it's a chance for the council to learn more about this program, this board, hopefully become a little bit more engaged in some of the work you all are doing um, and also will help pave the way for if there are potential future funding needs um, or just um, organizational things we have to go to council for ask for, we will be set up well to do that. I have a few questions sure. for you. Uh, one is the, the broader one, and uh, this isn't to uh, mischaracterize any councilman, because Councilman Lucas would ask the same thing a few years back, which would be, um, as, as a mayor and councilman, I voted to approve the city adopting our blueprint for violence principles. Right, we, we vote on and think about, I think, issues as relating to policing. So I think the question that uh, perhaps council will ask, but perhaps we can start with an answer here, is what, what does this add or how is this different in some way uh, from some of the other programmatic uh, efforts that we have taken previously? That's an excellent question, and I think some of the presentations we heard today are kind of in some of the connections we're making is actually the, the perfect example and the answer to that. Um, this is, to our knowledge, at least the first initiative and violence reduction initiative in Kansas City that has brought together such a diverse group of individuals who are working on this problem in different ways and from um, different perspectives. And I think the risk terrain modeling example where the police department is meeting with city planning, potentially now the health department, um, provides an example of how we can actually concentrate some of the funds we are spending on, for example, violence prevention, um, for example, intervention, or some of the other services offered by other individuals on this board in our highest violence neighborhoods, um, especially the relatively small portion of the city, as Captain Cobalt illustrated in his presentation, where most of our violent crime is concentrated. Um, and so I think there's a lot of work to do in terms of really figuring out how those um, how those things come together and how we're actually making specific investments, but that this program is at least providing a form where some of those connections can be made a little faster and maybe more easily than they have in the past. Okay. Somewhat related to that last question is, and this may go to you, Mr. Herman or Mr. Manser, um, because I saw both a positive in the interaction between um, the prosecutor and Dr. Jones, but also a potential shortcoming. Uh, the positive is that the prosecutor's office offered to be helpful in filling a funding gap in an area which is just great. Um, but the, the shortcoming is that we haven't institutionalized in some way that level of support. 
um, I, as a, as a budget person and all of that, too, would be interested in how do we do this long term uh, rather than kind of, all right, we found some extra money at the end of the year and we all are filling in whatever else we can do, which maybe that's part of budgets, but it's, it's not a great part. Um, how do we make sure, I guess, in terms of how combat is making allocations, and other than voting on the last time combat came up, I don't know enough about it either, but how can we make sure, for example, if the health department has meritorious programs, we're able to get those requests to you well in advance such that we can look to a more consistent funding understanding of what that relationship might be? because I think that this whole program is so new that it just hasn't come to that point yet. But certainly, violence prevention is one of the missions, so um, we would definitely look at that. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll just share. My wish is that maybe we all start to see all of this money that comes in every year is kind of going towards the same thing, which in essence it is. And so then we recognize, I won't even single out combat, you know, let, let's think of business support, right? The city council votes every year to provide millions in business support funding and perhaps maybe aligning it better with what the risk terrain model shows us are areas where we can do better improvement allows us to make more informed budget choices. I will present to you the problem that I present to you all the time, though, which is that absent that information or the collaboration we've all done, then we will make budgetary choices. They may very well be bad ones. But um, it's, it's, my hope is that perhaps this helps to inform us earlier as to where it's going. And same thing with combat. Uh, I don't know if I've ever made a combat request to your office. Probably haven't. Shame on me. But I think part of it is because I, I don't know when or where or why I should exactly. Not that I couldn't figure it out. But my goal might be that if, if we're seeing that there are certain programs that are appropriate coming from some tranches versus others um, that are aligned with missions, then we can actually look to do that, that work. I, I, I note this in one other way, then I'll stop talking, particularly at a time when uh, a lot of money is coming through um, and there's an opportunity for it to be spent well or spent very poorly. We're dealing with that in the homelessness situation now where there are millions coming through. I don't know if it's being spent well, but it's being spent. And so my hope would be that uh, perhaps as we have more resources, we're able to align those somewhat better. And I just ask you to share that with the prosecutor as well. Is one uh, probably relevant and additional update on that, and this is the last administrative update I had, is that uh, we were extended as another year as a DOJ PSP site. Um, and so most of you know that, um, or that this strategic plan that this board is charged with implementing came out of a DOJ-funded strategic planning effort through their public safety partnership. So we will continue to get technical assistance through that program for at least another year, I believe through September 2022. Um, if anyone on this board does have requests or specific things they'd like to know about what's going on in other cities, we'd be happy to forward that request to DOJ. Um, an example of, I think, things, reports they've provided information on the past include um, how some cities conduct their shooting reviews, and I know the police department used that to make some administrative changes um, to some of their enforcement proceedings. Um, also, um, I think looking at victim support, which is something we're working on as an implementation committee and a few other things, um, but that is exciting that we will continue to have that support. Um, relatedly, um, as part of that, BJA, which is the funder of the PSP program, is planning on coming to Kansas City in October um, for a strategic planning session that will kind of update um, where the strategic plan has, we've gotten from the initial document to a lot of things are now in motion, including this board. Um, Mayor, to your question, one of the specific items I think on that agenda will be what is long-term sustainable funding for that look like and what kind of administrative structures need to be in place in order to actually support this board in the long term. Um, so those are things we hope to have for the board to consider in the coming months. And I think obviously any board members who would like to be part of those discussions, um, we, we would welcome your participation and, and your involvement to the extent you'd like to be included. Um, the other thing I will mention on that, and I, I know we're missing a couple of board members today, so we'll need to follow up, but BJA has suggested um, that if board members are available on October 5th, a couple of their high-ranking officials would like to become able to present to you about 
um, their support of what we're doing in Kansas City and just about the program in general. Um, so I guess what I'd ask today is if anyone does have any known conflicts on October 5th to let us know that ASAP so we can communicate that back to them. And then we'll also be doing some follow-up scheduling um, with BJA to coordinate um, a time because we would like to be able to align it so that they can come speak to this board as well as have a longer strategic planning session with some of um, the implementation committee members later that week. Any questions for AJ? Great. Okay. Well, oh, it's not Dr. Jones. a question. It's just more of a thought. Um, not fully formed, so bear with me. But I've been thinking about, uh, and I know we've discussed a little bit about how to fit in some of the um, smaller, more grassroots organizations that are doing some of the work and thinking about um, one thing we have done is we have tried to bring more of them into some of the health department work. We see that there is... Um, there, there are needs for capacity building. So once you make it past the, the application phase, so not to pick on combat, but thinking about just the, the documentation that you have to pull together and then the application you pull together for funds um, and then the ongoing sort of reporting and tracking is necessary, we know, but we know that some of this can be a barrier. So I just want us to think about as we think about um, additional funding streams or future uh, funding opportunities that we might want to pursue and if we're going to try to bring others along with that, you know, people who are already doing things um, that may not be caught, when we do like the list of everything that's going on, those things might necessarily be caught, may not be necessarily caught, but we know they're ongoing. And so I just, I just say, I'm just thinking out loud and say we, we may need to figure out how to build in um, capacity building funds or something. So when I say capacity building, so we had to help people understand how to get their insurance straight so that they could receive a contract to do work. Um, and that took, I mean, we, like, someone at, from our office had to be on the phone almost with them and their insurance trying to tell them what we were talking about, um, needing just to even be a vendor for the city or, or maybe even, I'm sure, the county level is, is similar. So those kinds of supports, I think, will be ongoing. We don't want to look like we're leaving anyone out, um, but it is a different level of need um, to support those groups. It's a great suggestion. So we'll pass that along to, I think, as part of the strategic planning process too, see if there's a way we can identify maybe other cities that have set up programs that have helped with that. Yeah. Um, that's a great idea. I kind of want to piggyback on that. One of the things I think makes this group unique is that the eventual goal is to bring together those 60 organizations that are working on violence prevention so that we're all working together. And when I heard the mayor say that he was thinking about combat funds, I went, oh, okay because that's what funds a lot of these other organizations. So just keeping in mind that there's a lot of people doing this work and um, evidence-based, yes, needs to be, but there's a lot of people doing really good work. Absolutely. Although, uh, sorry, um, let me be the, because somebody should be the skeptic. <laughs> let me, and I love everything and every one, but I do want to make sure this is, this is what happens in the mayor's life and probably other people's life. I assume the chief hears it sometimes, too. You, you get a new group, and they're like, all right, give us $10,000, and we can, we can do all this magic for you. And, and I, they are good people, too. I mean, and they have wonderful ideas and all that sort of stuff. Um, sometimes we have to make a choice as to when or what we're funding and what we're doing. And so that's why I actually like the point that you had made before when we had the discussion on the risk terrain model, which is – you know, perhaps how do we, how do we sometimes, and I would like this group to remember, how do you encourage people to be involved without necessarily, you don't have to have an organization. Mm -hmm. It is the, the folks that are concerned business owners up and down prospect or residents, and where do we find a vehicle to keep them engaged without necessarily um, funding Quentin's new thing. And I think that's kind of um, where there has to be a balance at some point, too, uh, because... You know, I, there's, it takes both, really, and there are a lot of good organizations that I think are trying to find their, you know, they have evidence that suggests their successes, but then there are other challenges sometimes when you're not seeing the same. And, and I don't love it when we're just kind of making political choices on who we may like um, and what that program may be. And so I think as we're looking at this, um, also how do we channel some for whom perhaps an organization isn't necessary but there's already that assistance of the health department, the police department, with this organization or others uh, that can help us keep going. 
So not skeptical at all. It's positive. Okay. Any other questions about the updates? Thank you. Thanks, AJ. I would like to now open the floor for any additional items or open discussion that any member on the governing board might have. Case of combat, since we've been on combat a little bit this afternoon, um, there is a requirement for a nonprofit status to apply for those grant dollars. If we totally move away from a fiscal agent that is or has a nonprofit status, organizations like combat, we would not have access to their funding. That's my understanding. That is, I have talked to uh, some staffers at Combat, and if it is a governmental entity, you do not need a 501c3 or a fiscal agent to accept fun Combat funds, as long as it's a governmental entity. And since we have so many elected officials and representatives of city government here, yeah, I think arguably we could say this is a quasi-governmental entity and therefore would qualify for Combat funds. At least that is my understanding. Mike, please. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, like the city or the police department or the port, then you don't need, uh, you can accept those funds. But if you go beyond the, the formula, then that gets into a, a, the area that Karen brought up. Got it. And I don't have many details on the formula. Um, I just know that if it's a governmental entity, then you do not need a fiscal agent or a 501c3. And so seeing as how we have so many governmental agencies here represented on the board, I think there's a way of getting around that. Or a governmental entity. And the application, you can't even get past the first screen where you have to have a 990. Mm -hmm. So I would be interested in hearing more how, from a governmental standpoint, we make that application because there's two weeks left to get that submitted. Understood. And um, I can definitely connect you. Um, I can get with Mike to see who the best point person would be to connect you. Um, and again, I talked to a staffer and that was the explanation that I got. Um, so hopefully that is the case, but we will definitely connect you with the right person so you get more information. All righty. Well, it isn't the whole point of the program, uh, sorry, that we have the county here with this organization. And I just don't get the red tape, but I'm a lawyer, so I should know better. But I, I mean, we should be able to answer the question fairly quickly. I mean, is your, your thesis is we may need to create some extra entity to ensure that we can still receive combat funds. Now, I don't know how many combat funds we're even looking to receive. I do know being on the police board, we receive combat funds, mm -hmm. but I guess they come from a different fund source. Um, I, I don't know. It seems like something that someone should know the answer to fairly quickly. Yes, and I thought I knew the answer, I, but I, I guess there's a... <laughs> Uh, a slight change with the formula, and so we will get clear on that and make sure that we report back to the board on that. Because uh, he, he, here's my concern, right? Everybody wants to help everybody. I'm not trying to keep all here too long. We all want to help everybody. We all like everybody's programs and all that sort of stuff until we have to actually pay for them, right? I mean, I, I love everything until it actually costs me money or, or it's coming from mine instead of yours or somebody else's. And I think one hope we can have for our non-just positive meetings is when we can say, all right, I mean, I, I, I would hope at a certain point we can say, well, this is combat appropriate, this is city appropriate, this is, this is city and police budget appropriate, whatever else. And so we're not kind of, you know, saying that there are these useful programs that everybody likes, nobody can figure out, and we're, we're 
Ukraine for federal funds at the end. And I think this is the perfect forum to try to get to those decisions and to decide kind of best how to allocate different programs to various funding sources. And so we will we will report back with more detail um, at a later date for sure. But I understand where you're coming from, Mayor. Anything else for open discussion? I think this will be brilliant, sir, so use a microphone and we'll make it so the public can hear you. So my name's Juan Tab. I'm the executive, uh, executive director at Arts Tech. Um, Arts Tech served as the fiscal uh, manager of NOVA, now the Community Safety, Safety Partnership. Partnership. Mm -hmm. And so today it's a bit shocking to find that um, the attorney you know, some of the funds are going to be routed through the city. That in turn, you know, takes $36,000 per fiscal year out of our budget. Now, Arts Tech is a small organization, and that $36,000 equals a position for us, an employee. And so you said whether you said you get concerned when things start costing you money. When Arts Tech is managing those funds, it doesn't cost you as much money because we're managing the funds. We, you don't pay insurance. You don't pay uh, the salaries of that program. It's all incorporated in those funds. So it costs you more money to run the money through the city versus dropping Arts Tech as a fiscal sponsor. And so that's, that's one thing. The next thing is, at Arts Tech, we're working on several programs aimed at prevention, whether it be COVID, whether it be uh, working with at-risk teens. And so it seems like a lot of the funding that the city has at the moment is being uh, taken away from the youth and routed back to programs uh, aimed towards adults. And so crime, as we know, when there's intervention you know, in young folks, that, that, that intervention could be a deterrent to crime. And so we just want to be, we just want to uh, put the message out that we do good work at Arts Tech. We manage, uh, we have fiscal responsibilities and we have uh, gotten accolades for being uh, audited and also turning around and being able to show proof in the numbers that we manage money well. And so, like I said, taking a $36,000 or $3,000 a month hit, that means the world to our organization as well. Now, as far as, you know, really pushing that to the side, we work with young adults, teens, from the ages of 12 to 20, sometimes 24. And so a program that we've implemented that has been um, sponsored by Health Forward is the Jim Nunley Health Ambassadors Initiative at Arts Tech. What the program consists of, sorry, what the program consists of is um, 10 to 12 young adults who are gonna, who used uh, social media to reach um, individuals and their family affected by COVID, but also when COVID intersects with a uh, chronic disease such as diabetes. We know that COVID doesn't perhaps kill people, it's when it intersects with those chronic diseases. And so what we did is, is we got together our 10 teams. We had those teams uh, contact 100 people in their lives through social media or boots on the ground. And so what those young people did is they reached over 1,100 people, which led to 30 people getting um, vaccinated. But hold on, we trained them June 15th and our program just ended August 15th. So if we can bring this program to scale and do this for a three year period, let's say if in that three year period we reach 30,000 people, uh, I'm, not, I'm a social worker so math just wasn't my strong suit, but what if we can turn that number into 10 or 11,000 people vaccinated? So 
our teams, they reached out to other teams, which we know the state of Missouri is 11% African American or black. 25% of all African Americans are black people, or 25% of that population is vaccinated, and that's it. And then of the 25%, something like only 12% of teens are vaccinated. And so we have proof in the numbers that our young people can get out boots on the ground, grassroots, and push numbers. We can only do so much with the mini grant that we were um, allocated of $10,000. This program attracted the attention of uh, the news, Channel 41, uh, Radio 103, we, the county, gave the kids a proclamation. Uh, we had uh, Congressman Cleaver and a lot of uh, city leaders come to our event to honor these young people. And so the good work that they've done could essentially be thrown to the wayside if we don't secure funding for that program. And like I said, this was a pilot. And I've researched this. Jim Nunley's researched this. <laughs> we are the only organization nationally that are doing this, who are taking teens, training them through the CDC, uh, through Truman Medical Center, through, um, you know, Health Forward, just a lot of different uh, trainings. I train the kids on sales because we're selling the idea. We're overcoming object objections. We are learning to rebuttal. We're giving 30 second um, commercials. Hello, sir. My name is such and such. Uh, we're trying to educate the masses about COVID and um, take on some of the misnomers or myths associated with it. We turn results, and by, again, by us taking this $36,000 hit, that takes away from the good programming or the effective programming that we offer at Arts Tech. And, you know, over the span of a year, and I'm new, but I look at the numbers, and again, I could be mistaken, it's the social worker in me, but um, we've had funds cut out of a lot of things that we do. If it wasn't for the PPP loan that we were given, we'd be struggling. Now, we are solvent, we are working every day, but we need to put more programs out like this where we get teens involved. If you and I go out in the community and we say, get vaccinated, people are gonna look at us like, like we crazy. But if a teen gets out there and they're talking to another teen, hey man, why you didn't get vaccinated? Oh, I don't know. And they take on that objection, maybe we're able to get more teens uh, vaccinated. And so the proof, the proof is in the numbers. Like I said, these 10 kids over the span of two months reached 1,100 people. Through the, through the training, three kids got vaccinated because of immediately during the training that we put up. And so we just need to get the word out about these kids going out in the community and doing well. We also need the funding to do this. And this is good, solid programming. And we know with the Delta variant that's coming, this is not going away. I'm going for my booster, Moderna, in about uh, a month or two. And so we know that these things aren't going away. Teens do have a voice. We're all about empowerment. We're all about enterprise. We're all about taking teens off the street, which does prevent crime. And this is another way of doing that. And so I do ask that there is a consideration to fund this program. We've taken a hit from the city. We've taken a hit from the state. And I want to tell you that it's to the tune of about $136,000. I'm good at what I do. The salesman of, of me comes out, the therapist. I can play Jedi mind tricks, but I can't raise $136,000 just like that. And so we need the funding. Um, we've shown the numbers. We have attention of the community, and we need to have the funds to get the kids out there and working. You talk about crime prevention. You talk about the numbers. We're giving you that. We can give you the numbers. I'll give you a budget. I'll give you a proposal today. It's just we got to have more funds directed towards our youth. You talk about prevention. I understand there's models by the police. I understand all of that. I understand Metro PCS and all of that kind of thing. But I don't understand why we take money from our youth and reallocate them throughout, which says to those youth, you don't matter. 
And so I just want to, you know, give my views and give the views coming from the position of arts tech. And another thing is too, last thing I'll say, being a black man hired as an executive director of arts tech, I'm very honored. I take the place of Dave Sullivan, who's been there forever. And so being one of the few black men leading the organization, I challenge everybody who sit here, who sits here, I challenge you to keep me in my role. What are you gonna do to keep me in my role? I told you, I'm gonna grind. I told my kids, we grind. We're grinders. But I can't grind if I don't have the funding. And I'm, hey, I'm sending out my uh, proposals to Pfizer. I'm thinking nationally. I'm thinking internationally. I just believe in these kids and I believe if we can scale up to 1,000 teams and be able to reach 11,000, 20,000, we will push the numbers. It's, it's like football, it's a, it's, a, it's a number, it's a game of inches. And if we can get the word out and turn these numbers around, then I might as well run for president because I solved a problem that nobody has solved, you know? And so that's all I have to say. Thank you. But uh, the $36,000 hit, that's, that's disappointing, but we'll get it back. Thank you. Just to provide a little context uh, for the board, historically, Arts Tech, which is the organization Mr. Tab uh, is the executive director of, has been the fiscal agent for what used to be the NOVA board. Um, a number of the federal grants we've applied for require that the fiscal agent be a governmental agency, namely a city or law enforcement agency. So no matter what, the city will have to be a fiscal agent on the grant. Um, I think we're working through some of the details and once we hear back on some of the grant applications to figure out what the best way to do that to. Um, obviously, there will be consideration of this board, whether it makes sense to continue funding an external fiscal agent um, when the city is itself required or another organization is required to be a fiscal agent. So we expect to have more information on that uh, at your next board meeting once we have more information. But just so everyone's aware of the context, I think, of Mr. Tab's um, conversation and where his request is coming from. Um, can I say, just real briefly, I, um, Mr. Tab, I'll reach out to you just about some of the things the health department is doing around COVID and some of the open RFPs we have right now. So um, thank you for addressing that. And they got money. <laughs> so that might, you know, might solve it all. All righty. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Second? Second. All in favor say aye. aye. Thank you all so much for your time today. Good morning. My name is Andrea Dorch. I am the director of the Human Relations Department, and I am going to present on our uh, request to change the title of the Human Relations Department. This ordinance seeks to change the code to reflect